Hello and welcome to the Erlang Solutions monthly webinar. My name is Vladimir Milicic and I'm the VP for the EMEA region here at Erlang Solutions. Today's webinar represents a continuation of a series of webinars we have been organizing across topics of interest in the world of Erlang and dealing with solutions based on the Erlang programming language. Our webinar today will feature an Erlang Solutions customer who has used Erlang to implement real-time bidding or RTV and by doing so have revolutionized online advertising through offering unparalleled targeting and cost efficiency to buyers and helping website publishers maximize revenue. I'm speaking of AOL of course and in 2013 AOL have launched Marketplace by AdTech, a new RTV system that serves billions of online advertisements every day. The team at AdTech slash AOL have traditionally been using uh, C++ for the ad serving infrastructure. However, the introduction of RTB brought along its uh, very own unique challenges where a highly concurrent and a fault tolerant system was a key requirement which uh, obviously put Erlang firmly into the picture. Now, as with any live event, please do excuse any technical issues that, that we may face today, but to start by telling you a bit about Erlang solutions. We are a products and services orientated business. Uh, we are completely devoted to the Erlang programming language. And uh, since we started in 1999, we have worked with organizations and individuals using Erlang, helping evolve the language and supporting people and businesses using it. Today, we have just over 100 people across our offices in London, Stockholm, Krakow, Budapest, Seattle, and most recently, Buenos Aires and we work on projects across the globe involving Erlang and Erlang-based technologies. We provide services around the Erlang language such as code and architecture reviews, Erlang language training, Erlang consultancy, be that on customer site or remote, and we obviously support Erlang-based systems. On the product side, we develop solutions such as Mongoose IM, which is our open source messaging platform, the React Distributed Database and Wombat OAM, which is our monitoring and management technology, as well as other technologies applicable across sectors and problem areas where Erlang makes sense. Now, I'm really pleased to say that our speakers today are Philip Clark, a senior developer at AOL, Ronan O'Rafferty, the AOL technical manager, and Ken Wilson, the chief architect with the AdTech advertising division of the AOL group. Please allow me to finish by saying you are welcome to post questions throughout the duration of the webinar by using the chat facility on the webinar's interface. Our speakers, Philip Ronan and Ken, will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the webinar. If any questions do go unanswered, you're welcome to send us a mail and ask the questions that way. You can use the following email address, which is webinar at erlang-solutions.com. If you are interested in learning more about Erlang as a language or wish to establish whether it could solve some of the problems your own business may be facing, by all means feel free to contact us and myself directly. My email address will be displayed in one of the final slides of the presentation we will share with you today. The same goes for any other questions you may have, feel free to contact us. I would now like to hand over to our speakers who will be glad to start us off. Hi, I'm Ken Wilson from AOL. We're part of the AOL Platforms Group. About eight years ago, AOL acquired AdTech, a digital marketing company providing publisher, agency, and ad serving products to manage, serve, and evaluate online advertising campaigns, including video, display, and mobile for formats. We've been working directly with AdTech for the last eight years, extending their product range. In today's presentation, we will deep dive into real-time bidding, RTB, which is a huge service for AdTech, which now is provided for our customer base. Uh, but before we delve into real-time bidding, let me take this opportunity to explain some of the online advertising terminology. A publisher is someone or a company who is in the process of producing and distributing content such as literature, music, or information. Here in AOL, we're focused on providing publisher products for the internet and these digital publishers to create and provide content on websites, blogs, games, apps, and stuff like that. 
an advertiser uses online advertising, which uses the internet to deliver promotional marketing messages to consumers about their products or services. A placement is a snippet of HTML or JavaScript code that is inserted on a publisher's content or web page. When the web page is rendered um, to the user, the snippet makes an ad request using HTTP to receive a creative to be displayed on the web page. An impression, which sometimes is called a view or an ad view, uh, is a term that refers to a point in which an ad is viewed once by a visitor or displayed once by a web page. The number of impressions for a particular advertisement is determined by the number of times a particular page is viewed or, or loaded. An ad is almost always a banner, a graphical image of a designated pixel size, and a set of ads for a campaign is often referred to as creatives. An SSP or supply side platform is a technology platform with a single mission of an enabling publishers to manage their impressions and maximize revenue for their websites. Marketplace, the product that we developed, uh, is an SSP which uses real time bidding to provide this functionality. A DSP, demand side platform, is a system that allows buyers or advertisers to buy impressions uh, to manage multiple publishers through one interface. Real-time bidding, or more commonly known RTB, is a means by which publisher impressions are bought and sold on a per-impression base to advertisers via instantaneous auctions, similar to financial markets. With real-time bidding, advertisers bid on an impression, and if the, if the bid is won, uh, the advertiser's ad is instantly displayed on a publisher's site. OpenRTB is an open industry standard for communication between publishers and advertisers. It's a JSON-defined document that allows real-time bidding auctions, requests, and responses to be made easily between third parties. And finally, a second price auction is a type of auction in which a bidder who submitted the highest bid is the winner, but pays the second price or the second bidder's price or floor price, depending on the particular configuration. Here are some of the terminologies that will be used in this presentation and hopefully it'll make uh, it easier to understand as we go through it. Traditionally, ad tech has been a, a premium ad serving uh, for publishers. This means a publisher would have an actual team selling ad impressions via phone calls, emails, using human relationships, signing contracts tracks with advertisers. Cre creators would have to be distributed uploaded and hosted on publishers uh, websites to display on their content. As you can imagine this process is a very timely, costly and inefficient way of selling ad impressions. Hence the rise of real-time bidding, a method which improves revenue, lower costs, uh, speed up the selling process and provide an overall experience better for the publisher, advertiser and their customers. AdTech's tech stack has been traditionally a Java-based one in the front end where the publishers can configure their uh, system and, in the, uh, and C++ in the back end for fast ad delivery. When we were looking to build a new, uh, this new piece of infrastructure, the RTB, uh, we took a step back to see was there any better development methods or technologies available that we could take advantage of. The key things that are really are important to a real-time bidding system are fault tolerance and concurrency. After numerous brown bags, investigation spikes, we decided a, a prototype in Erlang was suitable. We took three developers who were well versed in C++ and with some functional language knowledge uh, to get a better understanding of, of the language. After which they implemented RTB prototype, which was reviewed by a group in, the, in terms of scale, maintainability, load and deployment, and we made a decision to, to actually use Erlang for building this solution. And we'll go into deep, uh, deeper detail about how that experience worked out uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, in this diagram that you can see in front of you uh, in the webinar, uh, you can see the, here's the publisher's page. And on it is a, is a placement or a HTML snippet, and it gets downloaded to the user's uh, browsers. Uh, as it's been rendered, it makes a, an ad request or a HTTP request to the ad server. Now, since our system is a, a, is a merger of C++, Erlang, and Java, we, we've only in this diagram showing the, the uh, mainly uh, Erlang components, but there are other components that happen as well. 
So this component here, the ad server, is written in C++. When a request comes in, it takes information about the impression, it takes key value information, it takes user segment information, uh, and so forth on the request to the ad server. It makes requests off to our infrastructure for direct sales, which is a C++ component, but for the purpose of this presentation, it's probably irrelevant. But it makes, in parallel, it also makes requests off to our RTB selectors. And it uses a 0MQ over Trift, which we'll go into detail later about further on the presentation. As this request is sent over to our RTB selector, uh, it finds out information about the mappings between this user and the different DSPs which will happen in the auction. So one user will have many, many mappings if there's many DSPs used. We fetch that out of our USS. The USS itself is a Couchbase uh, cluster storing user information about these mappings and it's stored as an XML file. This information is loaded into the into the selector and uh, with information in relation to the impression and how the auction will be executed. Uh, all this information is pulled together and, uh, and executed. What happens is that we make uh, open RTB requests to the various different DSPs uh, using HTTP, using the, uh, using the open RTB JSON standard and get these bid responses back. Uh, there's SLAs that need to be taken in consideration, uh, 120 millisecond SLA, uh, SLA that needs to be considered, depending on the different DSPs that take part and also depending on the publisher's configuration, this can be altered. And what we do is that we do a second price auction. So as explained earlier on, uh, the second price auction will occur, highest bidders wins the auction, second price pay, we pays the second price or the floor price, and that information is then returned to the ad, ad server. We, we log all the information that have happened in the auction into a reporting infrastructure, which allows us to analysis of why certain auctions were won, and also to an, uh, analyze how bid patterns happen into our system for yield optimization purposes. Uh, and what we do is then return the snippet of the winning ad to the browser, thus displaying the ad on the publisher's page. Uh, any time that we are dealing with any DSPs where we don't have any user information, we also inject pixels to ensure that we, going forward for the auction, that we do have these users mapped. It's very important for an auction that uh, the DSPs or the people who are buying into the auction understand the attributes of the user, so having these kind of mappings is, is essential for the revenue uh, uh, and correct bidding process to happen. Um, so. As that's a kind of an overview of how our system kind of works. What will happen is that we'll kind of explain how we got there a little and then we'll deep dive into, into the technology. Um, as I said, tr three years ago we got a prototype together and we rolled out an alpha, I think it was January, February, three years ago. And that alpha consisted really uh, connecting to one demand partner. And that one, one demand partner was only a couple of hundred uh, placements, uh, making a, a, only a dozen requests per minute. So it was a very small alpha solution. Uh, over the duration of time, what we found is that because the team was learning, we rebuilt it into a more modular, scalar, uh, scalable uh, solution. And Philip will dig deeper into that. Uh, and uh, we evolved the system over the three year period. One thing that our, our SSP had initially from the get-go, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a feature party with, with a lot of the competitors. So we only had one demand partner with a very few requests into our system with only 100 different placements over, over, for, uh, over a few different uh, publisher pages. Today, it, it has extended. We have uh, a million placements over many, many different publisher sites and, uh, and websites. Uh, those requests come into our system, generate up to 40 billion requests uh, per day to, to our DSPs. We approximately, we've integrated with 60 demand partners, which is very important. What we've noticed is that as every demand partner that we've integrated into the auction, it introduced more um, economics in, into, the, into the system and it, it does increase in revenue for the publisher. Uh, we, our uh, data centers has extended uh, in the East Coast and West Coast of the US for the auction part of our system. Uh, we've got 64 nodes each and we're extending that and also for uh, in Frankfurt and in Amsterdam. And we're a fully fledged SSP now, so we support all the te technologies in relation to brand protection, ensuring that when when a, an ad comes into a system, that it's uh, displayed for the right industry. 
Uh, we also do blocking of uh, uh, advertisers depending on publishers' uh, spend rights with, with certain advertisers. We also have functionalities in relation to malware scanning and so forth. So uh, between that and yield optimization, this is a full-fledged platform that we've developed over the last three years uh, using Erlang as, as a core solution to help us to develop that product. And in the next part of the presentation, what I'll do is hand it over to Philip, who will deep, de uh, deep, uh, dig deeper into the technology decisions that we made, and also talk about how we handle this in production and steps that we use to de debug problems. So hi, uh, my name is Philip, and I'm going to take a look through our system from the perspective of an engineer. So how did we get from a brand new prototype system, which went into production just a few years ago, to a system which is now sending over 40 billion requests to take part in an auction each day? I will look at the challenges and how we overcame them, how Erlang helped us to get our product out, and how we were able to manage the system in production. First then, how did we connect to the ad servers written in C++? The architecture is a bit like this. The RTB exchange nodes are here on the right hand side, connected over 0MQ to the ad servers. The ad servers send thrift encoded requests to a 0MQ endpoint on the RTB exchange. QA can also use this CRMQ endpoint for their test harness, which is written in Python. And we also have a 0MQ plugin for Sun for testing load on the system. Now, in reality, the architecture is a little bit more like this, where every ad server connects to every RTB node. This gives the system a lot of redundancy. It also allows ZRMQ to balance out the load across all RTB nodes for us. In an RTB node, there is one ZRMQ process running. Every request received by the ZRMQ process gets immediately spawned into a new process called an auction process. In the system, we will have many, many auction processes running concurrently. Initially, our code did this quite well until we hit some high load. Then it started to show up some problems for us. Under some very high load, we observed the message queue started to grow and grow in the 0MQ process. Requests were coming in at a much higher rate than what the 0MQ process could take and, and turn into auction processes. We discovered that this was mostly due to a selective receive statement in the 0MQ code. This has been fixed now, and also we have done some other major improvements on that interface. So far, we have been able to prove that the 0MQ process can take requests and spawn them into auction processes at a rate of tens of thousands per second. When a request gets received in the auction process, we then validate the request and select relevant campaign data. The campaign data is cached locally in ETS tables. These ETS tables are loaded when the system starts up, and then they are updated periodically during the lifetime of the system. Typical campaign information would include auction floor prices, brand protection settings, currency exchange rates, and so forth. The campaign data which actually gets used can depend on the request. So for example, we have to look at the geolocation of the request, if it was from a mobile app or a web page, and if the originating web page came from a secure HTTPS connection. We also need to contact the Couchbase cluster. The connection to Couchbase is handled via a process called RLMC. Initially, there was only one RLMC process handling all the requests for all the concurrent auction processes. This again worked quite well until we had a certain load. And then we discovered that the message queue started to grow also in the RLMC process. 
to fix this issue, we created a pool of those early MC processes and QSport is the application we use to manage the pooling of the resources amongst the auction processes. When we have examined the configuration data, uh, we then determine which demand partners are going to take part in the auction. For each demand partner, we will spawn a DSP process, where DSP here uh, stands for demand side partner rather than digital signal processor. The DSP processes build JSON messages for the demand partners depending on the protocol and the version of the protocol used by that particular DSP. DSP processes use HTTP to send the JSON messages over to the demand partners on a long-lived HTTP connection. The sockets for the connections are actually stored in a pool and this pool is managed by LHTPC. Uh, for each HTTP request to be sent, the LHTP socket pool allocates a socket for that request, and when the request is finished, the socket can go back into the pool for further use. The DSP processes will then either time out or they will receive a bid in the form of a JSON message from the DSP. These will get decoded and sent back to the auction process. The auction process will then choose a winner and send a response back to the ad server. So I have said that there is a lot of configuration data in the system. I'll, I'll now talk about how we started off handling configuration data and then how we change our architecture. Initially, the configuration data arrived into a master config node. Each configuration is, uh, is included in a JSON document. So each document got parsed, then stored into Amnesia before being pushed using Erlang messaging to each RTB node in the cluster. And for this mechanism to work, each RTB node had to be in the cluster. However, if there was ever a network issue, or perhaps if a master config node was restarted, all the RTB nodes would immediately reattach and ask a process in that master config node to send it all the configuration data that was sitting there in Amnesia. This worked well when we just had some configuration data and a few nodes, but as configuration data grew and as the number of nodes in the cl cluster continued to grow, the time to download the configuration data became unmanageable. Another doubt we had in our mind was that we didn't really know how big the cluster could grow or scale as we continued to add new machines to it. This is the, this is the architecture we use today. The configuration nodes are now independent, so we've removed this master standby concept. Any configuration service node can handle a JSON document. When a JSON document is received, it is now stored in MySQL rather than in Amnesia. The RTB nodes pull the MySQL database at regular intervals to get updates for the configuration. Now, the nodes are still in a cluster here, but they don't depend to be in the cluster. So if any node was to leave the cluster, it could still perform the delivery of auctions. One thing we did have to do was migrate all the data in Amnesia into MySQL. But Amnesia gave us a very nice API to do this, and we wrote a small e-script which converted Amnesia data into MySQL statements. One requirement we had in our system was to build features and get them out into production fast. The RTB nodes are not just a transport mechanism to transport requests from the ad server to a DSP. There is a lot of business logic included in there as well. One of the main benefits of Airline is that it's easy to develop new features fast. This is also a brand new component we were designing from scratch. So we decided we want to use best principle design practices. During development, 
we try to use test-driven development as much as possible. We use eUnit for writing unit tests and Mac for marking out external dependencies. In addition to this, we use Dialyzer for doing static code analysis. Now, sometimes adding specs to our code for Dialyzer to use can seem a bit tedious, but we do find that it pays back a lot for us by finding bugs, even bugs that we weren't able to find using the unit tests. In the team, refactoring code is a way of life, so new iterations of features usually change something in the existing design. But having unit tests and Dialyzer means we can refactor code with a very high degree of confidence. We do deployments every week. Either we will release a new iteration of a feature or we will release some improvement which gives the system some extra scalability. Within the organization, Jenkins is used for building both the C++ and Erlang components. For the Erlang Jenkins jobs, Jenkins will run our unit tests, it will perform code coverage, it will do the static code analysis, build an RPM for us, and just recently we've got Jenkins to auto-deploy our RTB exchange nodes into production. The RPMs which are built contain a full Erlang release, which means it has all the code required to start the Erlang VM on a bare-bones Linux box. That means when we install the RPM, we do not have to have Erlang installed system-wide on that host. Another challenge for our system was to handle third-party data. In our system, the third-party data can come from responses received back from the DSPs, and also the data in Couchbase originates from third parties. They say when you handle third-party data that you usually have to expect the unexpected. This, of course, is not possible, um, but Erlang has this nice letter crash philosophy which we were able to use. Originally, when we started to write the code, we were doing some checking and parsing the data we received. We soon learned that the best way for a process to handle corrupt data was to just crash. One DSP process crashing cannot affect the auction in any way, and it cannot affect any other ongoing auctions either. It makes the code handling third-party data much, much shorter to write, and it also gives you a very robust system. So I talked a little bit about some of the problems we had um, with scaling and taking up more traffic. And now I'll talk a little bit about the different tools that Erlang has given us to monitor the system. ETOP we found to be very useful uh, to monitor the system and find out which processes were using the most reductions and which processes were having message queues building up. This usually highlighted some single process, such as a chain server, acting as a bottleneck in the highly concurrent system. As a result, the single processes usually got replaced by edge tables or we replaced them by a pool of processes, usually managed by something like QSport. FPROF is another really useful tool we used. With FPROF, we could profile our system while it was live in production without having to do any special rebuild of the code and without affecting any of the traffic. Running a profile for about 10 minutes in a production system gives you very, very useful insights. For example, we found that we spent most of our time processing config data and we were able to change handling some long lists of advertisers from ON lookup times to constant lookups by using ads tables again. We also found that encoding and decoding JSON was putting a lot of CPU load on a system. So we replaced our Erlang implementation with a NIF, which is written in C. For statistics gathering, we use Folsom, and we export a lot of statistics for the system, both for the application and the VM. The statistics get exported every 10 seconds to a carbon server, and we have excellent visibility on things like percentile response times and other request data. Finally, the trace system is something we have been using a lot. 
I can give a quick example of how really useful that is in a production system. So in production, we have a lot of timers which we monitor. Just recently, we noticed a spike appearing in one of these timers. Uh, you can see from this graph that the spike appeared approximately every 20 to 30 minutes, and the magnitude of the spike was about five times the normal timer value. We were really unsure of what could cause the spike. It was not obvious to us from looking at the code, and it didn't really seem to have any relationship to high load on the system either. Now, if you consider if this was not an airline system, how would you find out what caused this delay for one auction in about one million auctions? We'd probably have to rewrite the code so that every event would get timestamped and store that in an in-memory database, and then have some kind of alerting system which can alert us when the timer threshold was exceeded. But by using the airline trace system, we didn't have to deploy anything new to production. We just traced every new process spawn. This flow diagram shows all the steps that we took there. For every new process spawned in the system, we checked to see would it call a particular function. And if it did, we recognized that that was going to be an auction process. When the auction process was identified, we activated tracing with timestamps. We recorded when the messages were received by the process, at what times the process got scheduled in and out by the airline scheduler, recorded the linked processes, and the function which was logging the timer value. When the timer value was seen to be over a certain threshold, we dumped all this information into a file. After a couple of hours, we had all the information logged in the file and we were able to find the root cause of the issue and fix it. Other highlights that we find in the system would be including the moving from 16 core machines to 24 core machines. When we did this, we did no changes at all in our code and we found that the load was balanced equally across all cores in the system. Lastly, one of the really great things that Airline gives us is this preemptive scheduler. The preemptive scheduler prevents long running processes from taking up too much CPU time. This enabled us to keep adding new features without worrying much about blocking the RTB auctions. I hope this short overview of our system has been useful for you. And I'm going to hand over to Ronan, who will talk about the people and our organization. Hi, uh, my name's Ronan. Uh, so I'll talk to you a bit, bit about uh, the adoption of Erlang and how it has worked for our organization and how we have in introduced uh, our people to Erlang. So prior to the start of this project, we had extensive experience building and operating reliable and scalable uh, platforms in C++ and Java to a lesser extent. At this time, AOL CTO was evangelizing Erlang, but also the CTO of our business unit, AdTech, proposed that the engineering team should examine Erlang as an alternative uh, for new projects. At this time, this marketplace, this new project, was presented and it presented new challenges and the problem space looked like a good fit for Erlang. This led to a successful proof of concept as has been mentioned and the se selection of Erlang. Uh, and so success led to success and we, we eventually released the product. All the while, uh, the team involved were encouraged to promote Erlang within the company. For example, through simple demos and uh, we also did a demo for several hundred developers within the company. Some of our team was involved in a cross-company hackathon in a face-off between Scala and Erlang. Uh, and we also found that when you want to promote Erlang, it's very important to know and quote your best metrics. So, of course, uh, in this case, we, this relates to the number of transactions that we process. In terms of ramping up the team and the knowledge, at the start of the proof of concept, we had a couple of developers with, with no experience of Erlang who went into a room 
for a couple of weeks. Um, after the selection of Erlang, we had a number of training sessions with Erlang Solutions using follow-up sessions and advanced training for a wider group of engineers. Putting the product in, into production helped develop our knowledge about operating Erlang in a live environment, troubleshooting, identifying weaknesses and bottlenecks and dealing with those issues. This was really useful for the learning process. Subsequently, we enhanced our team through consultancy with the help of would help on stability, scalability, and also new feature development. As the product launch was successful, this led to the need to deliver more features. The ability to quickly, or quickly onboard new Erlang developers was a challenge that we did not anticipate, but we considered a challenge that we could take on. Finding and hiring skilled engineers is a challenge no matter what it, your preferred programming language is. And so we continued with the approach in AOL, which is to look for smart people. This time we looked for people with awareness of Erlang, or interest in Erlang, awareness of functional languages. We also have looked to cross-trained developers in Erlang, particularly through hands-on experience, and we now have a critical mass of engineers that can help that process. Uh, we've recently uh, cross-trained people from Java into Erlang, as well as C++ into Erlang. Finally, uh, we have also were involved uh, two years ago in hosting an Erlang factory light in Dublin. Um, pretty much all of these approaches have paid off. Today, we continue to have a relatively small team, but we have a team of nine experienced Erlang developers. Roughly six of those are engaged full-time in Erlang development. Uh, we continue to leverage consultancy to suppl supplement our teams um, and we find that our, our developers are our best advocates for Erlang. For example, speaking at uh, events at Irish universities. And another point is that this year is the first time we've brought on an intern that has been working on in Erlang. So this is all progress. So where is the future life for us? Well, we continue to scale and optimize, refine, and continue with feature development of our platform. We, we can see that we'll be moving towards a cloud adoption over the next uh, short while. We continue to choose Erlang where it makes sense. And of course, we're continuing to look to hire smart people. And that's it from our presentation. So I think we're open to questions now. Well, firstly, to say uh, thank you, Philip, Ronan, and Ken, uh, for what was a, an inspiring talk on uh, your implementation of um, Erlang in real-time bidding and Erlang in general. And um, as you just said, uh, I'm glad to say that um, we've uh, had a lot of questions come in during your talk. Um, I just want to thank all members of the audience for posting the questions, and just to say that uh, whereas we do have a very limited time frame to, to answer these questions typically, uh, we do commit to answering questions in the order they were received. So uh, um, let's start with the first question um, I'd like to pose to yourselves, uh, Philip, Ken, um, and Ronan. Uh, so first of all, we have a member of our audience, Eugene, asking, um, are you presently using uh, physical hosting for airline hosts, or do you use virtual machines? So any one of you is welcome to pick up the question. Yeah, so so I can talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, traditionally at AOL we have our own data centers. So these RTB exchange nodes that I've talked about a lot are, are running on real hardware using 24 cores mostly in, in our data centers, except in Asia where we use Amazon Web Services for that particular data center. And we can see ourselves moving more and more towards uh, moving these machines to the cloud, whether it be Amazon or some other provider. Thank you for that. Um, let's move on uh, to the next question. I, I, we can already see we're receiving questions at a faster rate and we can respond to them. Uh, I'd just like to assure all the members of the audience that any questions that have not been answered during the webinar we will answer separately and send you answers via, via email. Uh, so next question coming from uh, Piotr. 
Piotr is asking, uh, why did you choose MySQL over other SQL databases? Yeah, so I I think in our organization the, the choice of MySQL was, was, was driven by the fact that we do have an ops teams with uh, a dedicated DBA uh, working there. So MySQL was always a very familiar technology to that particular ops team. And to, to minimize the risk, it was just better to choose a SQL database that our team was familiar with rather than to go and investigate a, a, a similar SQL database with similar features that maybe had some hidden gotchas that we weren't all that familiar with. Thank you for that. And I think the next question ties into that neatly. Um, Eugene is asking, uh, do you have issues? Are you experiencing issues with MySQL as a single point of failure? No. Um, we, we actually have a our MySQL database is actually a number of hosts running in a cluster. So yeah, um, we, we have a fairly large cluster there. Any any number of those machines can go down, and we can still pull um, the MySQL cluster and get results back from it. If there was any particular issue where the whole MySQL cluster would go down, um, it would be very unlikely, but the only impact would be that we wouldn't be able to update our configuration data during during the, the time of those MySQL databases would be done. So it's not going to affect delivery in any way, but, but generally our, our cluster seems very robust and we haven't had any issues so far where the whole cluster would go down. Thank you for that. Um, moving straight on to the next question, and again, apologies for uh, all the questions we won't be able to answer, which is quite obvious now. We're getting about five, six questions whilst answering one, so again, we will answer in writing. Now, Michael is asking, you mentioned in the presentation you were using 24-core uh, machines. Uh, is there a specific reason uh, why you chose 24 core machines? Yeah, well, <laughs> we just decided that 24 was better than 16. Uh, I, I think when it came, um, when we were getting more and more traffic into the system, um, the choice was do we add more smaller machines or do we add fewer larger machines? So, I, I, at this point, you know, uh, the development team was also doing all the deployments as well. We didn't have them streamlined very well either, uh, so sometimes doing the deployments could be a tricky operation. So it, it made a lot more sense for us to go with much fewer machines um, to work with, which were more powerful, rather than taking smaller machines. Thank you for that. That, uh, that does make sense. So uh, moving right on to the next question, um, in terms of uh, debugging, did uh, tracing affect, well, significantly affect performance uh, on production? Uh, so just to repeat the question, did tracing affect performance on production uh, during debugging? Yeah, uh, th that's a good question. Um, so, so tracing should never affect performance on production because I would always recommend you try out your trace on a, on, on a local host before you actually do it on a production machine. Um, it, in, in general, if you do your trace properly, you are not going to see uh, any, any increase in CPU at all. Um, if you use FPROF, which use tracing underneath it, yeah, we did notice maybe um, up to about a 5% CPU load increase, but I mean, that's, that's extremely small considering that, that FPROF is tracing every single function you call in the system. So, yeah, there's, there's various different um, applications that wrap around the airline trace system, um, things such as uh, maybe Redbug and Recon, but we actually chose here just to use tracing provided by airline trace or else the DVG module. Um, you do have to be very careful if you're working on a console and you put on a trace uh, by mistake that traces every function call, you, you're going to find that um, every single function gets output to your console. And probably that's going to increase the CPU load 
um, very high and the best thing to your system at that point is maybe to that it just crashes and restarts. So tracing is something you do have to be careful of when you enable it, but if you enable it properly, it's not going to affect your traffic in any way at all, and it's going to have a very minimal impact on the CPU. Thank you for that, and uh, I'd just like to thank the audience for all the questions we're receiving at the moment. We're getting some fantastic insights, and uh, again, we are committed to responding to all of these, uh, if not now at the webinar, then in writing. Straight on to the next question, uh, uh, Richard is asking, can you give us some idea of the size of your Erlang clusters, specifically? And we have um, <clears throat> two data centers in the, in, in the US, one in the East Coast, one on the West Coast. The Erlang cluster is 64 nodes in each, in each uh, data center. We also have data centers in Frankfurt and in Amsterdam, again, 64 nodes in each each cluster, and we have a small one ash on AWS in Tokyo. Um, what we do is that every every six months, eight months, we do a forecasting of how the product is, is growing and the traffic is growing, and we do predictions on that, and that uh, kind of you know dictates our kind of how we want our cluster and nodes to be extended on our, on our data centers. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, to try and honor as many as many questions as we can, we'll move straight on to the um, next one. So Oleg is asking, uh, why are you using uh, zero MQ instead of uh, native Erlang Rabbit MQ? So what's the reason for your use of zero MQ instead of something like Rabbit MQ? Well, R Rabbit MQ is just a it's a it's a very big application. Um, with, with many different routing patterns that just it's, it's just too much to fit our needs. Um, we in zero and Q we use this simple dealer router pattern and uh, it's it's very lightweight but it's although it's lightweight it, it more than meets our needs which is just to transport a message from from one ad server to the um, RTB node. So I, I haven't dealt a lot with RabbitMQ myself, but um, I, I believe it's just a much bigger tool featured application, and we don't need any of those features for this. Thank you for that. I think that makes uh, perfect sense. Now, the next question uh, asked by a member of our audience called Radu is quite interesting uh, because it's a question that we ourselves get asked all the time. And, uh, you know, we haven't found the magic answer, but I can try and see whether you have a good answer for this. So the question is, what was the biggest hurdle in convincing your organization to use a new language that it had very little experience with, both in development and operations? So how did you sort of approach that problem? Um, so I think the first thing is that it helped that the CTO of AOL was promoting Erlang. So, I mean, that introduces, uh, makes the path a bit easier. Um, so you've less people to convince. But I guess the business unit owners and the technology leaders in the business unit have to make these decisions. And they were also uh, looking towards Erlang, given the, the match in the, um, the problem space with the solution that uh, Erlang can offer. So we had to take um, a very a deliberate and considered approach to evaluating Erlang and get all the stakeholders involved, the, the, the architects, the team leads, the CTO involved. Um, uh, you know, look at the, the results of our proof of concept. Um, consider as many aspects as we can and, you know, and then really it, it came down to and the CTO making a choice, and uh, that was, I don't think it's an easy decision, obviously it's, it's qu quite a big jump, um, but uh, all those factors played towards us uh, choosing our line. Yeah, and also just to add to that, and it was said in the presentation earlier on, it's all about matrix, it's all about knowing your data and knowing what you're trying to explain by using a technology, whether it's Erlang or anything else, and I think when we did the prototype and we we're working towards the alpha. There were things that we, we heavily did. 
we spend a lot of time being able to understand what was happening with CPUs, understand the load, understand how the concurrent threads are being handled, and explain that and how the system would grow as features were being developed. So everyone was involved. You need people to sign off at every level, but understanding your data and understanding the problems that you're trying to solve was very, very helpful. Thank you for that, and I think you've mentioned uh, a couple of points that are definitely relevant from our own experience. First of all, you know, involving all the stakeholders, communication within the organization, but also another key word from our perspective and experience is uh, running a proof of concept. So we, you know, often get approached by organizations keen to get started in Erlang. Uh, to any member of the audience, if you are keen on introducing Erlang to your organization, and if you have ideas on a small proof of concept that could deliver tangible value, then by all means feel free to drop me an email, uh, which will be on the final slide if it's not displayed already. And we'll be, yeah, it's right there. We can happily discuss uh, with you your ideas, give you some guidance, guidance uh, pointers, and so on. Uh, so just to move on to the next question and try and answer as many of them as we can, we only have a couple of minutes remaining. Um, David is asking, uh, what is your HTTP request format, uh, GET or POST? Yeah, it's um, it's it's POST. Um, it's for POST for I think the majority of DSPs. It can be can be GET as well, actually. Um, w when we integrate with the DSP, um, the integration takes um, some days to complete. Um, uh, sometimes you get requests on DSPs to integrate with us. Most of them will use OpenRTB protocol, and then some will even have their own protocol that we need to integrate with. So at, at the moment, mostly posts, but also also GET methods can be used when we communicate to those DSPs. And uh, here's another really interesting uh, question from the same member of the audience. So David is asking, uh, how do you control back pressure? in case you get more requests uh, than you can actually handle. Yeah, um, th this is actually quite an important part of the system uh, because at, at, at one point we did add, add to our farm of 24 core machines, some virtual machines, and they could only work when they added some back pressure to the system. So what we, what we do is um, each request that comes in to the over the zero and queue, um, we decide shall we spawn the auction process or not. And we don't spawn the auction process if we are handling um, requests over a certain threshold. Instead of spawning the auction process and doing the actual auction itself, we can send back to the ad server a, a valid response, but just tell the ad server that there were no bids and that no one won in this auction. Thank you for that. And, uh, and again, also, sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, and also we um, we rate limit our requests to demand partners as well. So uh, it's not only protecting our system because we integrate with other third parties as well. We need to protect our systems too. So different demand partners have different rates that they can handle per second depending on the region. And we have that configured in, in our in our auction as well to ensure that we don't breach any kind of rate limits that uh, downstream third-party infrastructures can't handle. Thanks again. Uh, the questions keep flying in, so again, I must apologize. We're not going to be able to answer all of them. We will answer. We will try and answer at least three more questions, uh, and we will answer all the other ones in writing, as I mentioned. So to move on uh, to the next next question, this one is really interesting. Uh, Oleg is asking, uh, what was or what were the bottleneck issues with Gen servers? Yeah, so so it was a pattern we find throughout our system. Um, we, we have lots of concurrent auction processes running, and then each pro auction process can spawn multiple concurrent DSP processes. So you have many thousands of concurrent processes running in your system. So if all those concurrent uh, processes want to use a resource, and this resource is guarded by one single process, that single process is only, it's going to be scheduled in fairly by the airline scheduler. 
So it just means that, that one single process and system cannot possibly get scheduled in enough times by their own scheduler to actually do all the processing that it needs to do. Um, you know, what one another thing that we did try once as well was raise the priority level of a single process as to high priority, which did actually give that process more time being scheduled. Um, that's that did have a certain amount of success on it, but I think the principle is in a concurrent system you want everything to be concurrent and never depend on one single process in the system. So as I said before, you can either turn that single process into a pool of processes, or else uh, quite often you can find that that information that that process has can be represented by an ETS table with read concurrency enabled on it. Thank you for that. Uh, we have time for two more questions, so we'll uh, go straight to, to, to the first. Uh, Mikhail is asking, uh, can you tell us a bit more about user mapping to DMP data? DMP, DS, DSP. Uh, so basically, uh, what we have is that every user that comes into our system, uh, we have it uh, mapped, and we know the user. So it's very important for frequency capping and stuff like that we give a very good user experience. Uh, the, map, uh, the DSPs that are involved in the auction, they have their own representations of these users. They would have their own segments and their own way of looking at that across their infrastructures. So what normally happens is that when a request comes into our system uh, and a DSP is to be used, if we don't have a mapping for that user in our DSP uh, or in our infrastructure, we normally pixelate uh, that specific DSP. And what happens there is that when an ad gets delivered to the user, a pixel to the DSP is also embedded in that ad. Makes a request to the, to the DSP, given the opportunity for the DSP to recognize that user, and then to boomerang back to us, sending information which we then have as a key reference for that specific DSP, for that specific user in point in time. Going forward then, that user coming into our system uh, will be recognized by us, we be able to use that key for that DSP, and the DSP will be able to recognize it. The benefit for that for the DSP is that he can then do frequency capping. He can make the experience better for, for the user who's using our system, and also for the publisher, uh, properly price the bid, uh, the infantry coming into, into the DSP. Thank you for that. Obviously, it's all about uh, the user experience. So apologies to our audience, but we have time for one final question. And the question comes from Peter, who's asking, uh, what tool do you use at the moment for automatic deployments in terms of something like Chef or Puppet? And what are your experiences uh, in a nutshell? Yes, yeah, so uh, we use Ansible, actually, for doing the deployments. Um, I haven't been working on it very much personally myself, but I suppose from what I've seen, um, Ansible is a very nice solution because you know, it, we don't have to have anything special installed on the host we're deploying to, like, like a Chef server, for example. Um, also, the you know looking at the, um, the, the, the scripts we need to do the deployments, you know, it's looking much more like configuration data than an actual um, program. So, yeah, I, I can't give much more information about Ansible versus other uh, technologies, but so far it, it seems to be a really good solution working out for us. Fine. Well, that was the final question we could accommodate. Um, thank you so much to Philip, Ronan, and Ken for a great talk on AOL's implementation of Erlang. Uh, many thanks to everyone in the audience who has joined us uh, for the webinar. Please join us again for our next monthly webinar. And uh, following today, we will be sending you a short survey to make sure we capture your feedback of today's webinar. Please also note that the recording of this webinar and the presentation shared today will be available for you to collect on our uh, corporate website at erlang-solutions.com. I would also like to mention that uh, our Erlang user conference in Stockholm is coming up and will take place on uh, the 11th to 12th of June. EUC, as we call it, is the oldest and largest Erlang conference in Europe and is a perfect place to hear compelling, bleeding-edge 
Erlang talks and simply mingle with like-minded Erlangers. The early bird tickets uh, sign up ends on May 15th. So if you'd like, you can register for the conference uh, following the link on our website or simply by going to the Erlang factory website. Alternatively, just search for the Erlang user conference in Stockholm online. We look forward to meeting uh, all of you who can make it to Stockholm. I'd very much like to mention that uh, AOL is a platinum sponsor of the Erlang user conference in Stockholm. And it's also worth noting that AOL as a company are a member of the industrial Erlang user group, so supporting uh, uh, Erlang in that way as well. Thank you all once again, and we very much look forward to seeing you on our next webinar.